welcome to Occasional Randomness. I'm your host, Eric Scott, and joining me, as always, is my fellow co-host, somebody who is permanently stuck in the 21st century, Jason Johnson. I feel like this is a Duck Dodgers moment where I should have some kind of cool, relevant thing, but I got nothing, so. Although he was like the 24th and a half century, so I guess we're the not quite the 21st and a half century. Yeah, I just, when you said 21st century, that was the first thing that popped into my mind, so we'll roll with it. We'll get into more timey-wimey stuff here in a minute, but first, on tonight's podcast, we'll be continuing our journey through Farscape by recapping and discussing Season 3, Episode 18, Fractures, and then the timey-wimey stuff as we get into Loki Season 2, the first half, Episodes episodes 1 through 3, which is on Disney+. Plus. Ah, that's where the time references came in. I got it now. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> A little slow, but there we go. I'm behind the times, get it? Hey. All right, and the usual plug. If you like what we do here, please give us a like or a review wherever you listen to this at. Or help spread the word and let people know about us on Facebook groups, Instagram, X, slash formerly Twitter, or wherever else. We would appreciate it. All right, so keeping with the every other back and forth of who does what, I think this is the even episode numbers, so I think that's up for you now. Excellent. Well, let's see if I remember how to do this. Farscape Season 3, Episode 18, Fractures. Uh, we start out with Moya having detected a transport pod closing in to rendezvous, and everyone's concluded that it must be the crew of Talon. Crichton is anxious and asking Dargo which shirt, green or black, looks better. Meanwhile, Jewel advises Chana on what to wear for the reunion, and the, as the pot arrives, Crichton and Dargo speculate on the state of Talon's crew. The four go to the maintenance bay, but out of the pod steps a Scarin, a Nabari, and a female Hynarian, along with an unconscious peacekeeper tech. They say that they've just escaped imprisonment and ask for help. The Scarin, Nodj Gill, says that they were part of a peacekeeper weapons test to see how different species would react to their new weapon. Chiana, Crichton, and the Nabari, Hubero, are on the pod looking for a Bulite, a creature that has been blown to pieces but can survive as individual individual parts for half a cycle. Yeah, so how do you evolve that? But anyway, it, it's, it's a cool idea, and I love as Farscape does weird creatures, but that's kind of odd. Is that evolving or devolving? I'm not 100% sure. I feel like is it like, like the worms that you cut pieces off and they grow. I, I don't think we get that far into the anatomy, but... Yeah, weird. Yeah, because as we get into it, they have to put them back together. So it's not like that each one will form into a new bullite, but that's another story as we'll get into in the comments probably. But yeah, it's just, I love, again, Farscape doing weird things with beings and, and creatures and whatever. Yeah, it, it comes in a box or a tub and it's like, you know, some assembly required, you know, build yeah, your right. own bullite or something. <laughs> anywho. Uh, yeah, anywho. <laughs> Moving on. In, in private, Chieta tells Hubaro that she does not trust him, suspecting that he's a spy for the Nabari establishment. Hubaro then nervously drops his pants, revealing that he, she, is an androgen. Under the extremely conformist rule of the Nabari establishment, intersex infants are terminated at birth, with only a small handful escaping on the fringes of society. Chien accepts this as instant proof that Hubaro was even more of an outcast in Nabari society than she was. On Talon, Rigel asks Krace where they are, and Krace replies that Talon has found Moya at the extreme range of his sensors. Aaron enters with Stark's mask and tells Talon to intercept. When Pilot senses Talon's approach, Dargo sends Crichton to welcome them back. Rigel is first out, but is hesitant when Crichton speaks to him. Krace is next, but when Aaron steps out and Crichton acknowledges the familiar face, she simply says, Hello, John, and then walks away. Immediately noticing a problem, Crichton asks what's wrong, and Crace informs him that the other Crichton is dead. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, Shocker. Does kind of, yeah, makes filming easier, right, when there's only one of them. Yeah, although he was in the every episode anyway, so he's still getting paid, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's. I guess he was getting paid twice when he was on the screen twice? I don't know. That's a good question. Rigel returns to his quarters and finds the female Hanarian, Orin, there. She gets in his good graces by treating him as the Dominar, flirting with him intently. Meanwhile, as Chiana, Dargo, Jewel, Najgil, and Hubaro are in the bay, Chiana has a premonition saying that she heard a pulse blast, causing panic. Aaron wanders past the tech cell, and he tries to convince her to let him go. 
and of the value of the escaped prisoners, but she doesn't care anymore. Crichton unpacks the other John's stuff, and after sizing up their pulse pistols, he takes back Winona. He throws Stark's mask aside, causing an image of himself to appear. Stark says that he has a message for Crichton, and only Crichton, but it's interrupted by Pilot, who has detected a peacekeeper distress call from aboard Moya. Pilot says that Moya will starburst and Talon will follow on a close trajectory to meet up later. Chiana blames Nodge Gill, but Dargo sticks up for him as he never left his side and points the finger at Hubaro instead. Chiana jumps to her defense for the same reason, as Rigel acts as an alibi for Orn, as it had apparently been, <clears throat> let's say, amorously occupied at the time. Crichton wants to lock the prisoners up, but they refuse in favor of continuing to accompany the person they've been paired with. Crichton and Aaron are repairing the transport pod, with her handing him requested tools as she works. She ignores his attempt at humor, but when he tries to talk about the other Crichton, offering his condolences, she gets up and leaves without a word. Dargo enters and offers some advice, which at first is re it refused. When Crichton changes his mind and asks, he says that he actually has no advice to give, but that he understands it's tough. Crichton's jealousy over his own twin. Crichton says the other guy, the actual copy, died. And Dargo recognizes that the problem is that Aaron now thinks of him as the copy instead. Crichton wakes Rigel from sleeping, his sleeping with Orn and tells him that the prisoner's pod will be ready in half an arn. Rigel says he doesn't want her to go because he thinks he's falling in love with her. But Crichton says to make the best of that half an arn they have left, for if he truly cares for her, it's better that he lets her go. When Crichton leaves, Orn opens her eyes and says she heard it all and likes it, then asks if he's ready to go at it again as she's heard dominars are always up for it, needing no rest. Meanwhile, Chiana asks Hubaro what her crime was, and she replies that she's a nonconformist, and being androgen, not male or female, she pretty much had no choice but to be one. Crace and Jewel have managed to get the blue light talking, more or less, and Crichton asks who the traitor is, but it says it doesn't remember. Crace says the memory may be in brain matter that they haven't yet had time to add, or that it's already been or that it was destroyed in the blast. Pilot suddenly screams, shots fired. They rush out and find the scare and has been shot. Dargo threatens Hubaro and then grabs Orn. Both Chiana and Rigel stand by them once again, though, so Crichton gets a reluctant Dargo to release them. Pilot says that another signal was sent, this time including Moya's coordinates. They find a transmitter assembled from scraps of Moya, and Crichton goes to the caged tech, only to find that the DRD watching him has sensed no movement. Pilot says that the pod will be fixed in a quarter of an arn. As Crichton tells Rigel and Chiana that one of their people is the traitor, Chiana hides with Hubaro in one of the empty metal crates while Rigel and Arn hide out in an access shaft, only to go at it again in there too. Jewel and Crace heal the Scarin as Dargo and Aaron search for Chiana. Dargo is about to speak to her about Crichton, but she quickly tells him not to. When they leave, Hubaro tells Chiana that she doesn't want to cause her any trouble and runs off to return to the transport pod. As Jewel and Crace finish assembling the Light, more shots are detected. Their DRD was destroyed and the tech cell has been opened. Nodge Gill awakes as Orn wakes Rigel. She tells him that he must move now and much to his surprise, pulls a knife on him to emphasize her point. <gasps> You're the traitor. Yeah, uh, there they are. As the others search, Orn tells Rigel that she struck a deal with the tech earlier on the pod, and then on Moya she was pleased to find a great bargaining tool, Rigel himself. She reveals that she is actually a lowly soldier, and he'll be far more valuable than herself and a PK tech, and had to shoot Nodj Gill when he spotted her earlier scouting about. Rigel doesn't understand as all Harnarians sleep for hours after pleasure, but Orn reveals that the pleasure was all his, so she didn't fall asleep with him and could roam Moya freely. Suddenly, Moya is neutralized so that she can't move. The tech appears before Jewel and Kreis and opens fire on them, killing the Bulite. Running through the passageways, Orn shoots and kills Hubaro. The tech makes it to the pod where Orn is waiting for him with Rigel as a hostage. They leave Moya and begin broadcasting their location, as Crichton and Aaron with Dargo take pursuit in his new ship. The plan is to shoot the pod with a harpoon and board it to retrieve Rigel that way. Crichton worries the shot won't hold, but Aaron reminds him that it did with the Budong. However, he has no idea what she's talking about, giving Aaron the sad reminder that this isn't the Crichton that she fell in love with. They take the shot and it works, and Aaron and Crichton hook slide over to the pod. 
They blast their way in, and Aaron shoots the tech dead. As Orn tries to escape with Rigel on his throne sled, Crichton manages to hold on to Rigel. Rigel bites Orn, causing her to float away into space. Crichton looks on and flippantly says, Women. Talon returns as Aaron, Crichton, and Rigel are lifted off the pod, just making it as the pod explodes below them. Crichton is in his quarters, finally listening to Stark's message, which is actually from the other John, who recorded it after the destruction of the Scarens Dreadnought, just before he died from radiation poisoning. The other John explains that while the Scarens are back to square one with their wormhole technology, the Peacekeepers are Crichton's problem. Scorpius cannot crack the secrets which he might be very close to doing. Aaron, drawn by Crichton's voice, silently eavesdrop and overhears the hologram John tell him not to push her because she needs time. They have a final go of rock, paper, scissors, and as usual, both draw the same one, just as before. Finally, he emotionally wishes Crichton good luck, and the message ends. Aaron silently moves away on the brink of tears. With everyone assembled in Pilot's den, Crichton explains the situation. Pilot says that he and Moya are against the idea, and Talon disagrees too. Chana says that they don't know how far Scorpius is in his research, or where he is, and asks how Crichton will stop him. Jewel opts out, and Crichton says, though he doesn't like it either, he doesn't see another option. Unfortunately, he knows he must do this, but understands if they wish to opt out. After a long pause, the others watch as Aaron slowly joins Crichton. On seeing her join, Crace soon follows, while Dargo rolls his eyes. Chana thinks it's crazy and says that they're all going to die. Crichton asks if she's saying it because she's actually seen it or she's just guessing. John goes on to say that we all have a path to follow and he knows this is his. It's just something he has to do. He's going to hunt down the command carrier and he's going to stop Scorpius at all costs. A little bit of trivia from this episode. Paul Goddard makes his final appearance of the season in this episode. When David Kemper, the executive producer, saw the first dailies of Orn in her red feather boa, he joked that Carol Channing had taken a guest role on the show. Jonathan Hardy, the voice of Rigel, commented that Orn was a common little creature. She looked like Phyllis Diller to me. When Crichton interrogates the Boo Light, who at the moment is a little more than a talking orifice, he remarks, this is a little too naked lunch. This is a reference to the William S. Burroughs novel of that name and later film, which featured, featured a talking orifice of a similar nature. Both Lanny Tupu and Tammy McIntosh enjoyed their comedy scenes with the Boo Light, though Tupu worried that his scream would seem out of character. Thomas Halsgrove enjoyed playing the role of a peaceful Scarin for once. The cliffhanger at the end of the episode was deliberately heightened as producers knew that some viewers would have to wait months between episodes. Jewel receives an eye injury during the firefight and wears an eye patch in this episode and the next. The real reason for the eye patch was that actress Tammy McIntosh had experienced a minor injury to her right eye, which temporarily prevented her from being able to wear one of the contact lenses needed for the jewel makeup. And finally, this marks the first appearance of a living Hynerian other than Rigel on the series, though the remains of two appeared in Family Ties, heads decapitated from Crace's trophies. It is also the only on-screen appearance of a female Hynerian. So, what do you think about this one, Eric? So, as we've been guessing for like the last couple episodes, you know, yay, the band's back together finally, which, you know, they only got four episodes to go, so they better get back to it pretty quick. And, you know, pretty much you, I think we're all thinking it, it would have gone about as well as it did with Aaron seeing the other now only remaining Crichton, which we'll talk about here in a bit. I kind of got like a, almost but not quite like a, like a mirror universe vibe of the transport pod crew versus the Moya crew. And the kind of each of the same archetypes kind of paired up. You know, you have like Dargo the tough guy and the Scarin tough guy together. You have, you know, both Nabaris together, scenes with Crichton and the Sebation, and some Aaron and the Sebation. And of course, finally, another, another Hynarian. So now we got a male and a female Hynarian together. And if you want to further, I guess, keep the uh, Mirror Universe theme going, that Hynarian isn't quite as harmless. She's pretty ruthless, in fact. Or at least more outright ruthless than Rigel's been so far, most of the time. And then, of course, like you said, or what they said in the trivia about leaving off a cliffhanger kind of for months or for some people, that, yeah, they kind of set up the rest of the season here, which, again, it's about time because they only got four left. So at least now we know where the rest of the season is probably going. So what do you think about it? Yeah, I'll, I'll agree. You know, we, we've been looking forward to getting the crew back together. So we kind of got that resolved. I, I'm putting that in air quotes that, you know, yeah. we can see, but, you know, 
yeah, <laughs> obviously there's there's still some resolution needed uh, between the death of the other Crichton, and I haven't thought about it, but there's been a quite a bit of time, you know, between the off-screen and on-screen adventures that they've been separated. So I don't know that we actually have a t- timeline, but it's been a good while. So there's there's you know obviously a lot of it's not just a, oh it's been a week type reunification. It'll be interesting to see how that works itself out. I do want to go back to your your comment about the mirror universe because I thought I was kind of thinking the same thing when I saw them, and I was actually expecting it to be like a peacekeeper trick, you know, where they they've kind of put together their own version of the crew, right, to to try to match the archetypes and the and the the character types. Uh, but obviously that that wasn't the the plot this time. But I think that's an interesting approach. Yeah, because I mean, even the Scarron was against type. He was you know. A- peaceful like helpful scaring versus you know their own version of ruthless you know i'm dominant i'm going to take over everybody so yeah it was kind of you can even go that far too yeah probably less aggressive than uh dargo for sure all right so let's see so knowing where we're going with trying to stop scorpius and the wormhole technology and stuff do you think maybe this peacekeeper weapon that they're testing out on the transport pod is somehow connected to that i mean maybe maybe not I guess, you know, we have four episodes to go, so we'll see if they mention it again next time. Yeah, it's either a weird coincidence or there's another weapon being developed, right, that we'll have to deal with at some future point. When they first mentioned that the blue light was in pieces, that was my first thought was that, you know, it was having some kind of wormhole turned into goo type result. But I guess that wasn't the case because in this case, they were able to reassemble them, right? So it wasn't the the molecular breakdown that we've seen with other characters who jump through wormholes without the correct uh, protection. Yeah, and if it was a weapon, obviously it didn't affect the other four. It just affected the blue light. So chalk that up to bad test. I don't know if that was the case. If it was, I forget what they said. Like if they were escaping the test or they got hit by the thing. So maybe they never even got the weapon fired on them, but they were going to be. But whatever. Yeah. I, I, I don't think they explained that very well. Yeah. Then again, we might find out next time if they, once you find out what the weapon is, maybe. So who knows? We'll see. <laughs> yeah. It'll probably come up later or not at all. Yeah. <laughs> Knowing this, 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 <laughs> this series, it'll never be talked about again. <laughs> so, right. This is a one off. We'll never see people again. Well, of course, they all, they all died anyway. But the point, the point being. <laughs> okay. Well, I was going to mention this later, but you, you said that. So I'm going to ask Did they all die? I. Th- I don't remember the Scarron. I know he got shot and he was laying there on the table. And then the firefight started again. Maybe he got shot then too? I don't know. Yeah, I, I was trying to re- replay that because the entire crew, the you know, entire group got killed or he's still floating around somewhere. I couldn't re- really remember. So. Yeah, because his pod's been blown up because that, that, the whole thing blew up. So if, if he was still on Moya, then he's still there, but he's the only one left. <laughs> yeah, so now they have a Scarron or not. Unless for a second time they can put a blue light back together. I don't know. That seemed pretty definitive there when parts were flying everywhere. But I don't know. It's when they flew apart the first time and he came back. Or it came back, whatever. So I don't know. All right. And then we got a... In the beginning when Crichton's getting getting all gussied up. Wanted to go meet, you know, look look his best for the crew. For Talon, which wasn't, but he didn't know that. There's a, kind of a funny scene where he asked Dargo, what shirt looks better? The black shirt or the green shirt? And Dargo's like, I like the black shirt. Which is a great callback to thanks for sharing. As we talked about earlier in the season, however far back ago that was, when we first had to deal with the twinned Crichtons. In order to tell them apart, Aaron gives one a green shirt and the other one a black shirt. And the black shirt one is what, not what, who left to go on board Talon and who Aaron fell in love with. So now she comes back and there he is, black shirt Crichton, <laughs> right in her face. Yeah, and it was a simple way to get. Crichton back into the standard black shirt that he wears, you know, for his standard outfit before the twinning, right? So just kind of a clean way. Otherwise, he'd have to keep wearing green and it'd be really confusing. Yeah. Uh, but I he, did like Dargo's... Res- Go ahead. I was say, he, he gets Winona back, his gun, because he, he, he pulls out the gun he was using, and then that one, which they do look a little different. And so he's like, ooh, I got my gun back. Why he couldn't modify yeah. or find another gun that looks just like it, I don't know, but, you know, I guess you, you like your personal things and, you know. I really thought he was going to go dual holster and just have one on each hip, you know, when he was dual wielding them. Yeah. I just, to get, just to go back to the shirt for one last thing, though, I did like Dargo's response, right, where he's like, I always thought the green one made you look, you know, funny or had, had didn't fit or whatever. It was, it was a nice little Dargo dig. It's, you know, you've been wandering around that stupid green shirt this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I hate green. Green's not your color. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and then in, in kind of keeping with the twinning references, Janet is still having her premonitions of future events, which seems to have come about after she was twinned back in Thanks for Sharing, or before. So I guess, so far, I think every time she's had a premonition, it's come true so far. So I wonder if they're going to play that up in future episodes and maybe try to stop things from happening because they didn't do a very good job here um so maybe we might have like a fun plot device next time it could be like oh you saw this we need to stop that from happening or something but this time around 100 percent got them all right yeah i mean it, it's an interesting ability that they, they really could do a lot with so uh, it kind of just comes up real briefly here with the i heard shots fired uh, and they do but not till way later so yeah they've got some some interesting things to do with it if if it holds true, right? Yeah, it was, it was kind of comedy the first time with stuff falling and when Jewel was, you know, hanging around Moya's little sludge down there, and it was all funny, haha. Now it's getting kind of serious, so yeah, we'll see where they take it. All right, and then I guess the the second main plot line, or first, if you depending how you look at it, is what we've been waiting for for half a season now, or actually not well since what three episodes? Whenever Crichton passed, the first Crichton died or second Crichton, again, however you look at it. <laughs> it's a, they should rock, paper, scissors for it. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's all the same. Is a, how Aaron and John would react or interact with each other. And Aaron's treating him, as Dorga mentioned, as the copy. John says that was the copy. So, yeah, again, we have denial or doesn't matter <laughs> with, with John or the Johns. Dargo, you know, tries to give, or you know, Crichton wants some advice, and Dargo's like, yeah, I got nothing for you. Uh, I'll just kind of support you, which again speaks to their friendship that's been developing over the last three seasons. And we finally get to see what Stark's mask is for, which not exactly how we were thinking it was going to be, of like some kind of like memory dump, or Crichton would somehow put it on and instantly have all the memories of the past Crichton. So it's the old old style way, uh, a video more or less of Crichton explaining what happened probably, and to the best of his ability, I guess, in the time he had left. I guess we're kind of close, but not quite. That is probably the most extravagant recording device I could think of. You know, I mean, <laughs> they're on spaceships, and we don't have anything that records messages that he could send over that's not like, oh, here, Link, get you this. One. The only thing that holds my face, light, power, energy, containment. Yeah, you can use that as a MP3 recorder, and I'm, well, I'll just go away without anything to cover my face. I'm, I'm not sure that. That makes a lot of sense, but it does make for a cool prop, I guess. Yeah, I mean, we, we've, we've had DRDs do recordings and projection video, you know, like the, you know, the you know, Help Me Over One Kenobi reference that kind of got when I was watching the first kind of popped up out of nowhere. But yeah, it's, is it overkill? Or are they going to do something else with it? And that's what they came up with? I don't know, but okay. Now Stark's running around with no face mask and here it is on Moya. I don't know, unless... I, I don't know. Is, is this like a Star Trek three to four thing or two to three where some part of Stark's in there? So if Stark dies again or something, he can come back from the, I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> or does he just show up with a ski mask on? And he's like, I want my mask back. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. We'll see when he comes or, back. Or that's how he'll know where they are because he's got his mask on the ship and you know, he, can, he can home in on it. Who, I don't know. Who knows? You, you never know with Stark. There's all kind of weird stuff there. And I guess finally, as that part of the plot, uh, the message wraps up, it seems I kind of got the idea that Aaron's kind of coming around to the fact or the idea that they really are both the same Crichton, just with different experiences. So again, we'll see how long that lasts before things progress in their relationship again. Maybe not too long as we only have three episodes left, unless they want to push all that off and just deal with cliffhanger stuff into season four. But I guess we got three more episodes to go, so we'll find out if they pick it up a bit or kind of drop little nuggets in the last three or something. Maybe have like a big, I love you at the end of three when like, you know, Crichton look, maybe he, he might look like he's dead or something and then cliffhanger. Yeah. I, I think that going off the pace that this, they've historically gone, I'd be surprised if we get anything before that cliffhanger or the, the next season. I mean, personally, I'd like to get, you know, past it. It's, I, I think I'm on record as the, crew drama back and forth where they want these and we get progress and then up oh, that guy died it wasn't really used so now we're yeah probably my least favorite part of the show but 
I, I, I say that tentatively, right? I mean, I, I like the show, so it's not, it's not, it's not terrible. You know, it's, it's still a, a highlight, but it's just not my favorite part, uh, the drama. Uh, I'll revisit that when we get to the end for the, the wrap up. But yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I would like to see him resolve it faster than not. I'll say that. Yeah, I can see either way. They could string it out because if they want to keep it like a real relationship, even though it's a sci-fi TV show, that you know, this is probably how someone would react to that kind of scenario. But then again, we all know it. Let's get back together. Come on, let's go. Well, we just did it. That's the only. That's the only thing, right? We spent every other episode with them developing the relationship on Talon, and yes, that's just a different John. But we've already had the relationship developed. Now we got to watch it again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now probably the part that you probably didn't like, but we'll see. You think after the uh, the peacekeeper distress signal was sent out, or especially after the Scarron got shot and they couldn't figure out who it was, that probably the best, most logical thing to do, haha, not, not the first kid does that, is to lock everybody up so you can keep an eye on them in all in one place. But no, they want to keep doing what they've been doing, which is, no, they were here the whole time, it couldn't have been them. So if everybody had track of everybody, then it wasn't them. But yet stuff happened. So either what you're doing is not working, or there's a mystery sixth character we haven't seen yet running around doing things. But really, I mean, it pretty much came down to it's probably Orn, or if the Bulite could be independent somehow and not have to be fully reformed, and somehow like that other parts they couldn't find of the Bulite was running around doing things. But that's probably too far fetched for a show. So it's. Gotta be the one you wouldn't expect. The 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 little docile. Oh, I'm just a poor little Hynerian, You know, don't look at me. I do love the fact that you just said it's too far fetched for this show. So we'll we'll skip right over that and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and go with you know. Uh, you're right. I mean, it's probably not my most major issue with this episode. Um, which again, I like. So there's not a lot of negative on this episode. But yeah, they're, they're typically the as as you can expect from this crew. Their conflict prevents the rational solution. Of, hey, let's just lock everybody up, and then we wouldn't have had any trouble, right? Uh, until we got to the bottom, of, bottom of which one's the traitor. I'll admit I got it wrong. I was expecting one of two things. I was expecting either the Bulite to be the villain. You know, like you said, some part of him's actually the, out there. He can exist in multiple pieces or something, and whatever. Or I was kind of thinking that the whole thing was a the whole crew was in on it, like the whole pod crew, and it was all just one big fake. But both of those were wrong. But that was that was my original pick. Uh, Instead, we get uh, one you don't expect, as you said earlier. So. Yeah, it's always the quiet one. Well, I thought she wasn't that quiet, but anyway. But yeah, so i will not exactly entirely sure what her what Orin's plan was. I mean, I guess that obviously turning Rigel into the Peacekeepers and the rest of the crew was wanted was probably going to be better because they're probably more wanted than they are at the moment. But, I mean, she was free. They were all free. They could get dropped off somewhere and go about your business. She doesn't know about you know, Crichton and Scorpius and wormhole technology and, you know, that since even they didn't know about it um, until later the episode. So maybe I guess she didn't want to be a fugitive and hunted down. So she was going to turn in higher priority escape prisoners and, and get off, which I'm sure that's peacekeepers do that all the time. Haha, <laughs> Right. So, yeah, but hey, it almost worked, I guess. Yeah, it, it did. I mean, I'm not really sure how that went, you know, from, from her plan. But once we kind of started down that path, you know, you get the uh, predictable resolution, which that, I think this is where my negative from the, from the episode actually came in, which is uh, it wraps everything up really quickly. Right. I mean, as I mentioned, I, I missed the scare and dying if he died or is he still there? We just kind of seem to lose him. And then the, the other members of the crew all get shot or killed. You know, we lose kind of each member, including uh, spacing the, the, the villain. So, it's just kind of boom, 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 and we're, we're done. So uh, the, other than the one little bit of uh, good interaction between John and Aaron where they're, you know, she's remembering uh, or references something that, that the other John would remember that he wasn't there for, that was probably my favorite part of the ending. Other than that, it just kind of was like boom, boom, boom. Okay, we've wrapped this up. Yeah, and, and, and you know, the, the, the poor Bulite, you know, he, he just gets put back together. He's like, oh, good. They, I made it before the cutoff of when I got to get put back together. Oh, crap. And he gets shot up and dies. Oh, and they're gonna be they're gonna be finding blue light on on Moya for years. Yeah, there's gonna be parts everywhere. There's probably parts in the Jewel's eye. She's wearing an eye patch now, so you, you don't know what's gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah, we got the big the big ending that sets up the rest of the season. Looks like 
you know, Crichton's got to stop Scorpius. He's got the Wormbolt knowledge that he, now John knows about because John, th this John didn't have the knowledge unlocked in his mind by uh, quasi Daddy Jack back in that one episode. So, you know, this John's clueless. He has no idea what's going on other than what the other Crichton told him. And then it's kind of interesting that Aaron decides to go along with this plan. So I guess we'll see why next episode, maybe. Maybe because she knows firsthand what that technology can do because she saw it. Uh, or she doesn't want to lose this Crichton subconsciously or even consciously. So she's going like, to keep an eye on him, make sure he doesn't do something stupid. And then I, I kind of thought it was also interesting that kind of all the human-looking crew decide to side with Crichton while the non-humans are against it and think he's crazy. It maybe it makes sense that since they're dealing with peacekeepers and bases and command carriers, and that there's not going to be any aliens there, just all Sebastian-looking people. So they wouldn't be able to blend in this well as the human-looking crew. I don't know. It's a theory. I'm sticking to it until next episode, when probably I'll be totally wrong. But yeah, and it is interesting that they're immediately breaking up the crew, right? I mean, everybody just got back together in, in this episode, and now we're splitting up somehow. We don't know the details of the split up, so maybe they're not splitting up that far. But it is an interesting. Okay, you're here, so now I'm leaving. But then again, the other interesting part to me was that I thought about this as you were saying that last bit. It's not only the the non-humans that stayed behind, but it's the crew that he was with, right? This John's been with Dargo, who's basically his best friend, Chiana, Jewel. They've been together um, on Moya. And now when he says, oh, I've got something I've got to do, it's Aaron and um, Kreis who are on the Talon crew that go with him. So I don't know if that has any meaning. It's just an interesting split. Yeah, because it's, it's almost like the same crew. So it's almost like the Talon crew minus Rigel, who's now back on the other ship so yeah it's kind of like they, they just got another john almost yeah almost putting it back the way it was <laughs> we, we just got back together <laughs> now now the band's breaking up again what the heck but i guess as always we'll find out next time so anything else you want to talk about about this one no before we I, move on i think i think i i expressed this one i think i will say overall i did enjoy the episode and, it, and we got a lot of the resolutions we were looking for uh of reuniting the crew and and seeing how they were going to react to each other so I think overall it was good. It just was kind of interesting that we had a couple of minor stumps, but yeah, I, th I think it was a positive episode overall. Yeah, me too. wasn't the best, but it wasn't the worst either. So yeah, nice in the middle. Plus, then all the good character bits about what we really care about if, is John and Aaron. So they progressed that as always. So yeah, and our, we're we're about to hit some multi-parters, right? Which we always seem to like better. So yeah, you would think it's got to be either. So we've got th we got what three four left so it's gotta be at least a two-parter in there somewhere so whether that's it's probably the cliffhanger <laughs> you know the two, two two parts for the ending or yeah the, the last of the season three beginning of season four or even both we could have you know a couple of two-parters or whatever we'll see but next time is not because it does not say part one in the title so not dead giveaway next time well yeah see that's how we know so next time on the podcast, we'll cover Season 3, Episode 19, and hopefully this is the way you pronounce it. If not, we'll find out next week. I yench, you yench. So playing our usual guessing game of what does that mean, congratulations, Farscape, you got me. I got no idea what that word means. I, I looked up online, and not really anything concrete that came up. So nope, not a clue. I mean, th there's two I and you, so maybe there's two people, or it's like, I don't know, it sounds like it's like two people like i this and you that or something so but obviously it's gonna be about something around the plot of stopping scorpius that's all i got yeah i uh they, they got me as well I, I i've got probably less than you came up with i, I you're gonna laugh at this one i'm, I'm honestly stuck with uh, ice cream you scream we all scream for ice cream because that's what i i hear when I, you start anything i something with that pattern but anyway uh, <laughs> now i just want ice cream i think is where i'm at yeah i don't know other than obviously we've got the crew and i don't i don't know how that title factors in and up to it all so i guess we'll find out so does ice cream matter if crackers don't matter oh wow you got that one in we hadn't done that in a while uh well <laughs> but the crackers if they don't matter ice cream can't matter because ice cream is better than crackers yeah so ice cream has to matter because it's more important than crackers mm. everyone likes ice cream this is true there's uh, no ice cream well, in my house. At least now, now I'm sad. <laughs> yeah. We've eaten all of ours. That's why I was thinking about it. Anyway. <laughs> all 
All right, so that is your homework for Farscape. So if you care about Disney Plus and Loki and Marvel stuff, continue on. Otherwise, you can drop off here. And uh, I'll try to find some Loki music and insert that between here. And welcome to all you people who skipped the Farscape part to get to the Loki part. Yeah, so you have no idea what we're talking about. And, and, and if that's go. you, please go back and listen to the Farscape part. <laughs> yeah, because we have lots of episodes about that. So, you know, as you can tell, we're up to season three, you know, almost at the end. So there's a lot of stuff back there. So go listen to it. Yeah, this is when and, you, you know, came in. Yeah. And click like and review and say, this is wonderful. These guys are amazing. Whatever. Just do all that stuff. Ring the bell. Like and subscribe. Wait, that's YouTube. Shoot. Oh. <laughs> Keep spreading the tapes. Wait, that's MST3K. Um, wait, so. Reference acknowledged. All right, so let's get into the first half of Loki, which be season two, episodes one through three. For some reason, the last bunch of Marvel stuff has been like eight, so I was thinking it was one through four, but even the first Loki season was only six, so I guess they're keeping it the same here. Which is funny, because this is one that could have used an eight, in my opinion, and... Uh... Or I would have liked to have had an eight because I'm enjoying it, whereas I think some of the others could have been trimmed. So, yay, Marvel. Always doing stuff I don't expect. Could we have taken two from Secret Invasion and added them to here? But anyway. anyway. <laughs> yeah, I'll trade you two Secret Invasions for two more Lokis. Although here we have lots of Lokis. But anyway, different different concept. But Not as many as you'd think. Yeah, not as many as last, uh, last uh, season. So, we'll do the quick recaps, then we'll get into the three. So, season two, episode one... Ouroboros. And is that going to be complicated to say here in the future? But we'll... I have a solution, which we'll get to that. Yeah, they, they give us a little, a little out on that one. So, All right, so we kick off with uh, In the Past, which apparently that's where Loki went after end of Season 1. The TVA, or Time Variance Authority, has attempted to apprehend Loki while he's uncontrollably warping across time in their own headquarters. In the present, Loki reunites with Mobius and warns him of the threat posed by the many variants of He Who Remains, i.e. Kang, if you're watching the Ant-Man movie, the TVA's creator. TVA General Docs has several TVA hunters arming themselves, supposedly to find Sylvie, that's a, another variant of Loki, who caused the sacred timeline to branch after she killed He Who Remains. Loki and Mo Mobius meet the TVA technician Ouroboros, who deduces that Loki is time-slipping, a phenomenon possibly caused by the branching timelines, dangerously overloading the temporal loom. To save Loki, Ouroboros instructs Mobius to approach the temporal loom with a temporal aura extractor, a device to extract Loki from the time stream just as Loki prunes himself. Sounds painful. Loki time slips into the future where the TVA is being evacuated as the loom goes critical. He encounters Sylvie before he's pruned by somebody at the last minute. And back in the present, Mobius successfully pulls Loki from the time stream and they set out to find Sylvie. And then if you actually stay through the credits, in the mid-credits scene, Sylvie enters a branch timeline in Broxton, Oklahoma in 1982 and goes to visit a McDonald's restaurant because I guess you're hungry from time slipping or something. I don't know. Yeah. Well, if you're going to a McDonald's, 1982 is not a bad bet. Right, because that's when they made fries with uh, beef fat, which is much better than the current fries. But that's my opinion. And hamburgers with beef. So it's a win-win. <laughs> that leads us into Season 2, Episode 2, Breaking Brad. Loki, Mobius, and Hunter B-15 find and capture Hunter X-5 in London, 1977, on the Sacred Timeline, where he lives as film actor Brad Wolf. Under interrogation, he admits to abandoning Dox's mission and reveals Sylvie's location. Meanwhile, Ouroboros attempts to repair the loom to safely accommodate the branching timelines, but discovers he cannot access it without help from the missing Ms. Minutes or He Who Remains. Loki, Mobius, and Brad travel to Oklahoma and find Sylvie working in a McDonald's. Loki tells her of their encounter with the TVA's future and asks for her assistance to figure out what would happen, if Sylvie, but Sylvie refuses to involve herself with the organization. After pro Brad proclaims that the group is in mortal danger, Sylvie enchants him, forcing him to reveal Dox's plan to simultaneously destroy the branching timelines with reset charges. Sending Brad back into custody, Loki, Mobius, and Sylvie capture Dox, but her plan largely succeeds and some of her loyalists have escaped. As TVA receptionist Casey tracks the rogue Ravana Renslayer's tent pad to one of the remaining time branching timelines, Sylvie declares that the TVA is rotten and returns to McDonald's with he who remains tent pad in her possession. 
And then we wrap up the first half here with episode 3, 1893. So now we see where Miss Minutes and Renslayer have been. They've traveled to Chicago in 1868 to secretly give the TVA handbook to a young Victor Timely, a variant of He Who Remains, who arranged all this before his death. Then they travel to the 1893 Chicago World's Fair on this branch timeline, where Loki and Mobius arrive tracking Renslayer's tempad and see Timely presenting his temporal loom prototype to the crowd. Timely then has four groups chasing after him, Loki and Mobius, who need his aura to fix the loom, Renslayer and Ms. Minutes, who want him to take his variant's place with them at his side at the end of time. Sylvie, who wants to kill him to prevent his rise to power. And just to keep it with something local, we have a robber baron and his allies wanting revenge against Timely's fake invention scam that they purchased for lots of money, apparently. Timely abandons Renslayer for proposing a partnership with him. At Timely's Wisconsin laboratory, he turns Miss Minutes off after she professes romantic love for him. Okay. Yeah, hey, you know, AI, you know, it's, that's the hot thing now. Uh, then uh, Renslayer... Think Loki. about that the next time you chat GPT something. Yeah. <laughs> Are you in love with me, chat GPT? Yeah. Renslayer, Loki, Mobius, and Sylvie all arrive with Sylvie gaining control. Sylvie allows Loki to take Timely back to the TVA, then sends Renslayer to the Citadel at the end of time, with Miss Minutes also being brought along. There, they see He Who Remains' decaying corpse, or I guess He Who Remains' remains, as Miss Minutes reveals that she The remaining remains of He Who Remains. Yeah. <laughs> and they see... Yeah, his corpse, and then Miss Minutes reveals that she knows a secret about Renslayer, which we won't know about until next episode. So, that's a, a quick recap of the first half. What do you think? Man, I, I forgot how much this show just keeps me confused, and that's a good <laughs> thing. I mean, I, I, see, previous comment about, you know, the show being a little cookie-cutter and predictable in certain spots, I've never had that with Loki. I, every, I end every episode going, what did I just watch, and what am I supposed to remember? So... Yeah, I don't have a clue what's coming next. It's it's a great change of pace from a lot of the other shows. Yeah, I mean, like last season, it was like every episode was just so completely different because it could be. I mean, you're you're jumping timelines, you're jumping to alternate universes, where you can just change everything, and just just go nuts. And they did. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and and this one so far is is keeping keeping pace with it. Yeah, last time I really loved them jumping, like you say, they they didn't just jump times they would jump genres hey it's the end of world apocalypse sci-fi hey it's you know old timey hey it's you know the end of the universe yeah you know, we, we can cover all these things a little less this has been more time jumpy you know uh speak you know focusing on certain timelines but uh yeah it, it, it's the, the story and and what they're working in this is you know rivaling anything i've seen out of marvel anywhere else in a while yeah because now it's kind of like the, almost like the backstory of the tva how it got where it got to what it's actually doing keeping reality together and that kind of stuff and seeing like the bowels of it and that kind of thing which is cool because you want to know more about you know what this place is so yeah i mean we'll see if after this year that they start jumping around doing weird or more weird things than they have so far but so far it's been every show's a treat it's like i don't know what's gonna happen now where they are what's going on exactly and uh at the beginning of season two they give you a little choice of a recap of season one which is good because I, I didn't skip over that like I, I do most things because it's been a while since I saw season one and I didn't go back and watch any of it because there's just too much TV and media nowadays. So I don't have much time to go back and rewatch current stuff. I rewatch old things like Farscape plug for what we just did. Right this one. Well done. Because I haven't watched that in 20 years. But, you know, I, only, I watched Loki like what, a year ago, like two years ago. So I'm not going to go back and watch it again. I'm glad I watched it all to refresh my memory. Since, like we said, season one went every direction. <laughs> and season two takes place exactly probably to the second after season one ends. So good for the recap. Same here. I, I did really want to go back and rewatch it because I, I enjoy going back and reviewing stuff that's that good. But our crazy schedules just kind of haven't allowed it. Uh, we, we've got a lot going on in different places. So, you know, this, this was a, a great way to jump back in. They did a good job on the recap. I, I just always have loved time travel stories. I, that's why I've been a Doctor Who fan for 40 some odd years. And, you know, time travel movies. And I love like shows that play around with how time travel could work when dealing with events like in your own life. Kind of like the, the Bill and Ted riff where Loki's interacting with Ouroboros in the past and present. And you can kind of see Obi, which we'll call him now because I can't, I'm not going to say Ouroboros anymore. You kind of see how Obi's memories keep changing as the past Loki, who's really from the future, past where they are, but back in the past. 
is explaining things and then it's kind of like no you can't time slip in the tva and then back in the past oh you're time slipping in the tva and then back to the future well i guess you can time slip in the <laughs> so, so it's like bill and ted where it's like if, if i was from the future i would know to put the thing i need right now over there so i can use it and then poop it pops up over <laughs> so I, I, love that kind of, I love that kind of stuff yeah obi's a great character addition and honestly out of these three episodes was probably some of my favorite parts right i mean you literally get to interact with the guy who literally wrote the book, the TVA book, and he gets to bounce off of everybody else because nobody else remembers the stuff that he remembers. I mean, we're introduced to him with him talking to Mobius, and Mobius is like just clueless. He has no no memory of any of it. And he's playing it off like he does. But Obi's like, oh, yeah, this one time you were here, last time you were here, you did this. You know, it's like, oh, we're evidently got a lot of missing information here, and, and we got a character who, in his own way, is, is a has a lot of that knowledge. Yeah, and for like time not passing in the TVA, or supposedly not passing, like I think the Obi or somebody say it was like 400 years since Mobius was last there. So yep. how does he know how long it would have Because he, he's not being mind wiped because he knows everything. I guess because everybody forgets about him. He's down literally probably at the bottom bottom level as you're walking forever down what looked like, I don't know, like the inside of a dam or something. Like that, that kind of old concrete wall kind of stuff like in the bowels of nowhere so like probably everybody does no does he know he's down there <laughs> probably. Well, just look at his ticketing system i mean good grief yeah right again old school keeping with the theme which we'll get into here in a second and then yeah the, the show does like the comedy stuff wonderful with the drama and the comedy so like the whole thing in this first episode with with mobius mentioning like every couple of minutes that yeah my skin's gonna melt off <laughs> if he doesn't rescue Loki in time outside the TVA. I mean, every couple of minutes he keeps mentioning, like, my skin is going to literally melt off me. And everyone's just kind of like, yeah, whatever. Like, <laughs> everyone just ignores him or <laughs> just downplays it. And he's like, no, seriously, my skin is going to melt off of me. And some of the better Marvel and even Star Wars stories are like that, that, you know, you balance the humor with the drama. And this just does it wonderfully. And what makes it work is it's humorous, but it isn't just for humor, right? The time slippage makes use of it you know he he writes when, when they walk into the the room he actually writes like skin question mark or something like that in the dust on one of the, the sides of one of the monitors and when loki jumps into the time slips into the future that's there and that helps you kind of differentiate the past from the future right because now you know he jumped forward not backwards it's kind of a neat it's humor and it's useful at the same time yep. Yep. again going back to what i love about creative use of time travel which must be wonderful for the continuity person on the series to try and keep all this stuff together. But good job. They're doing a good job. Yeah. It's it's that guy with the bulletin board and the yarn. Just kind of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the murder board of uh, timeline. <laughs> so, yeah. So after the events of last season, now that the, the one timeline is now branching like crazy, you know, the, the, the monitors got like just, you can't, you almost can't even see the individual branches at this point. They're all just so many of them. And we learn that it's overloading this thing called a temporal loom that keeps the time streams manageable and doesn't prevent everything being destroyed. And like I said before, yeah, we're, we're kind of getting it more into how the TVA really works, which I think is cool because that was the big, you know, you didn't have to know about how it worked last season, although it was kind of nice because you kind of know what, why are they doing this. And I, I just love the 1950s styling of the TVA, like the aesthetics, like the with the the monitors, the the, the, the core, everything. Uh, and they keep leading into it here. You know, all the new locations we've seen, it's all like 1950s, like industrial computer rooms or uh, control complexes, that kind of stuff like you'd see in, in like a 50s TV show or movie or something. I, I love it. Yeah, it's interesting because it's, you know, for a time travel trip, time, oh, wow. <laughs> Easy for you to say. It, it's interesting because, <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> it's interesting because for a time travel show, they really like that aesthetic, right? I mean, it's kind of the, the steampunk, like you said, the, the 50s styling and all that, which they've settled into, and it's what these characters are comfortable with. But, yeah, we're not spending a lot of time you know, to, to go with the Bill and Ted reference, you know, in, like, the medieval past or, or something like that, dealing with real ugly dudes. You've got a lot of the World's, World's Fair and, and, and that level of, of scenery, and it's kind of a, a, a neat focus. It's kind of, it's time travel, but it's tight, right? Yeah, I mean, it's almost, it reminds me too of um, Fallout, if you played that, those computer games, because Fallout kind of, when the world gets nuked in wherever time it is, they kind of keep that same vibe hundreds of years later in the post-apocalyptic stuff, so, which that's a, a series coming to TV next year, I think, so maybe talking about that, who knows. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm likely to watch that because I obviously skip the games. But anyway. <laughs> And then uh, just a little bit of trivia, uh, I guess, from the, the Thor comics back when I used to collect them and how it relates to here. So at the end, when she pops up in Broxton, Oklahoma, I was like, ah, because that was a reference, I guess, back in Thor comics, after some disaster happened to Asgard, Thor recreated like Asgard City in Broxton, Oklahoma. So I thought that was kind of a fun nod to the comics or like in this alternate reality or something or... Yeah, not not to be confused with New Asgard, which is where Valkyrie's currently rolling, right? So. Yeah, in our I guess the sacred timeline, that's where New Asgard is. But yeah, maybe in a uh, one of the branches, you know, that's where New uh, Asgard got, ended up in Broxton instead. Mm-hmm. And then we kind of pick up with stuff that they kind of dropped at the end of season one, where uh, some of the TVA people are starting to wonder what their lives were like before they were kidnapped, more or less, and brought to the TVA, since they're all variants of their versions of the sacred timeline themselves just get mind wiped so they don't remember who, why they're here just they're doing the job so that was fun that they keep going with that obviously they want the branch timelines to continue because that's where they're from but the others don't i.e general docs doesn't like it so it's kind of i wasn't surprised that general docs was out to destroy all the other timelines because they, they kind of telegraphed it because all the agents that were going through the time portals were carrying armloads of those pruning grenades and if you're just going to find somebody you wouldn't take all that kind of hardware with you. Yeah. It, I, I think we all saw it, but it was interesting to me that I didn't, I guess I just didn't expect such a quick resolution because, you know, in, in other shows, that would be something that we have to wait like two episodes to get back to. And it's like, no, no, we handled it. <laughs> well, I guess you only got six episodes, right? So he can't, he can't string out for too much. Yeah. But you know, not the bash shows that we've already bashed, but uh, you know, if this was a secret uh, invasion, It'd be three episodes. Yeah, true. So, you know. Well, that's because you got two more episodes to fill. No, no. <laughs> just kidding. Mm. What you could bring, what you could bring here, and then make it last longer. See, that's it. See, we try. They should, they should put us in charge. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I got forty years of comic experience of reading them. I can anyway. All right. So then we get into episode two, which is kind of funny, where uh, Hunter X Five has gone native, so to speak. He's back in 1977, or actually probably before then when he got there and he's now a famous actor brad wolf although i don't know how famous that really is because that movie seems pretty cheesy although i I would probably watch it so i'm (laughs) i'm guessing at least one of brad's variants or this one was an actor i guess if if, is he going back to what he was doing before he got kidnapped they don't really mention it but i'm that's what i'm kind of thinking of if you want to get back to doing what you were doing maybe that's what he was i don't know or at least subconsciously right because like like mobius and the the jet skis it's kind of Maybe he doesn't have his memory, but he's got the, the itch. Mm-hmm. So, And I love the whole good cop, bad cop interrogation scenes with Loki and Mobius trying to get Brad to tell him where Sylvia is. And then they're, they're going through the, at the end, where it thinks like Loki's gone rogue and he's going to torture him with that little box, that little, whatever you call it, the little energy cube that he keeps putting him in and gets shorter and smaller and he's getting all crunched up. And he's like, okay, I'll tell you, man. I'll tell you. So that's kind of funny. Yeah, it, it does lead into... I, I, I hate to even say it because I love this show so much, but but I guess my one gripe with this show, and that's Loki's power level, right? Sometimes they portray him almost like he's human. He's, you know, running with Mobius, chasing people down and running around corners and and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, oh, when he reaches a certain point and gets sick of it, he's just like, oh, yeah, I remember that I'm, you know, the god of mischief and can do all this cool magic and poof, poof, poof. And it's like, that's awesome. But why now and why not then? You know, it's just kind of like storytelling. So. Yeah, and he's, he's not wearing that collar that makes him not be able to do his magic. So, yeah, you think if you're doing the, all this kind of stuff for centuries on your own, you just, but yeah, you know, drama, fine, whatever. Although Sylvie doesn't, you know, try to get Brad to talk. She just, she just controls him and go, and he's, you know, so she, she's not playing around. <laughs> so she at least still knows she can, she can do magic. Yeah, she's not going to pretend to be regular. She's just going to nail it. <laughs> yeah. Although she's pretty much done with everything. She just wants to enjoy her life as a McDonald's employee, which... Great product placement. Uh, I wonder how much they paid for that versus making up your own fictitious fast food like chain. But anyway, she doesn't want to go back and th- until I guess you know she forces Brad to tell the whole story. And obviously, then if General Doc succeeds, then where she's at is going to get pruned. So might as well go along. And again, as we've mentioned before, more great comedy with Mobius and Brad eating and talking about McDonald's food. Yeah, another great spot for Mobius to just tune a scenery right and mm-hmm. ha 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 and uh 
and and just you know he he's all over this this show he he's not they're not holding him back at all he's he's going at it but uh i'll i'll reiterate my they're definitely at the golden age of mcdonald's where the food was actually real right if i had to eat a mcdonald's hamburger that they, they picked the right spot man i wouldn't mind the pricing either back then <laughs> so when, when they showed their board i'm like well big mac for like what 50 cents or something like hey what or whatever it was and then, uh, to your point, yeah, we got a little set piece, and we're all done with the, uh, we tracked down General Docs and stopped her, but they didn't fully stop her because lots of branches got pruned, although I guess not all of them, because Sylvie goes back to uh, McDonald's branch, and she's fine. But I, I guess it's just being nitpicky, because I guess th- th- they can't do it for reasons, because you know, numbers too high mean nothing to people. So they keep going on about how Docs destroyed millions of lives, but if each branch of a timeline is just Earth, that's, that's billions, but if each branch is a whole universe, which is probably what it is, that's like trillions or quadrillions or who knows what. But I guess if you say trillion or quadrillion, people just don't it doesn't register. So millions, I guess people can grab their heads around. So it sounds more relatable, I guess. I don't know. That's my, my only little quibble, I guess. Yeah, because we're we're still learning about the aliens, right? I mean, Guardians of the Galaxy and and Kree and Scroll and uh, had introduced us to all those, and we've got you know. Uh, Nova Prime and and all the different uh, alien races that Marvel start started to bring in a little bit, and each one of those it's it's you know each branch is getting that snapped out of or ha ah, snapped ha ah, blown uh, detonated out of existence too so mm-hmm. pruned so yeah it, that's that's a ton of people, uh, but on the bright side right it it did resolve the issue with the loom being overloaded for a while because there's not a lot of branches right now. So. Yeah, you kind of like re- reset things and give you some breathing room while they run around to try to find some version of he who remains that can help them. Which, ah, and speaking of he, jumped us into episode three, which I, I thought was a nice surprise since, and I didn't put this together, and I'll mention it in a second. For some reason, I don't know when they filmed this, so I'm thinking because after Ant Man, I think we heard about Jonathan Majors, who plays Kang slash He Who Remains, having some le- real world legal issues. So I was expecting him to be in there. You know, obviously this was filmed before all that happened, and then they spent another year or two doing all the effects or just the release schedule or whatever. So when I saw like Renslayer dealing with one of his variants, you know, Victor Timely, which we'll get into in here in a minute, I thought they would do something like with that, use a different actor when he's an adult. Because obviously as a kid, he's, he's a different actor because you know, he's only like 12 or something, so different than however old Kang is or looks like, you know, 30s, 40s, whatever. So I thought maybe they would use a different actor when he's an adult, and explain the way it, it, like it's a different timeline, so he looks different, or something. But nope, it's the actual actor from the who played last season and in, in Ant Man. And then when I was looking around, I completely forgot that they had a whole Ant Man Quantum One of the end credit scenes had Loki and Mobius attending his presentation at the World's Fair in Chicago. So okay, makes more sense now that all this is filmed years ago, and they just finally got around to releasing it today. <laughs> I think I, I either missed that at the end of Quantum Mania because I know I saw Quantum Mania, or I, I completely forgot it myself because I still don't remember it. I take your word for it, but I don't remember that at all. But yeah, I I get the same impression that this was all filmed before because, and I don't want to go too deep into you know speculation and rumors, but you know one of the things that's, that's kind of circulating out there is that Marvel's looking to move away from Kang as the bad guy right now because of all that legal trouble, right? I mean, they either have to recast him or or do something different. And so, you know, obviously people are rumoring like, you know, Dr. Doom or something like that to be the new bad guy, but, and they may speak, stick with Kang because all you gotta do is bring in a variant, right? Yeah, I'm not not sure where they're gonna go with that. It was a surprise to me too, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I mean, again, like I said, they, they could recast him with somebody else because it would it would fit. Because from the comic days, if and that, that's where they're pulling these things from ultimately and then tweaking them for movie stuff, the Victor Timely alias is an alias or like an alternate self of Kang. It, it gets kind of messy because Kang himself is just an alternate self or a different name of Nathaniel Richards, who's a time traveler, who's also the father of Reed Richards, who's Mr. Fantastic of the Fantastic Four. So that's another good way to maybe get the FF into the MCU. And, you know, Victor does have a whole town named after him in Wisconsin called Timely, Wisconsin, where they ultimately go at the end of at, in the middle part of season uh, episode three. So, you know, you could recap, you know, there's lots of different versions of Kang out there. There's like, which we saw some of that in the another end credit scene of Quantum Mania, where they all the Council of Kangs get together. There's like the Pharaoh looking guy, which Pharaoh Ramatut, that was one of his aliases. There's like Immortus, which I think was the one guy that was talking in that one scene. 
in Quantum Mania. So there's lots of other Kang versions that you could maybe get with a different actor or something if you wanted to keep going with it, just kind of explain it away real quick to the audience and off we go. But again, we'll see what they do. Yeah, I remember the name also, probably not in that much detail, but uh, I definitely remember the Victor Timely. I'm like, oh yeah, that's, that's, a, that's an alias there, or like you said, alternate self. And like, like we said, that's what makes Kang a, a good villain if they do it right, because there's all these different versions of him that they can pull from that each makes it could be a full movie villain on their own, right? So, yeah, I mean, you know, you got you know, 50 years of Marvel comics because Kang was, I think, first introduced like in Avengers number seven back in like 63, 64. So, I mean, you've got well, now almost 80 years of Kang and various stories out there. So, you got all kinds of things you can pull from. So, we'll see where they go. Yeah, that's that's the next phase 80 years of Kang. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then, speaking of keeping the vibe of things, I love how they, they got the whole look and feel of the 1893 Chicago World's Fair and the wacky and in this case partially working inventions that people were coming up with back then you know when people would try to scheme rich donors or regular people for money like you know that's why I got the the coin uh, the snake oil salesman like these products don't work they just could sell them to gullible people and say this will cure everything you know although thinking about it I guess it's not much different than the 1900s or 2000s really just different products for different times (laughs) And different global people. Yeah. But you know what I was focused on? Is that really when Cracker Jacks were released? Yes, it was. Because I looked it up because I saw your comment. And I looked it up before that we recorded. And Cracker Jack was first introduced to people at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. So well, there you go. The, the important stuff is there. So again, good on the continuity person for yeah, <laughs> pulling that star, one off. Because that's, I, I would not have guessed that. But that's, good. that's a cool piece of trivia to, to break out in the middle of a show. Yeah, I mean, maybe when they were saying, oh, we're going to do an episode in the, in the at the World's Fair 1893 Chicago, someone looked it up, and it's like one of the trivia notes was, Cracker Jack was released on, you know, I don't know. Oh, we can put that in the show. <laughs> I bet the toy you got with it in the box was a lot better. Yeah, I mean, it might actually, it wouldn't be plastic, because that wasn't invented yet, so probably wood, <laughs> I don't know, something. Anyway. There, there probably wasn't, yeah. Or was there a toy back then? I don't know. Again, I didn't look that, that I, I, didn't look, I didn't look that deep into it, but. And hey, we finally got our... Uh, other recurring character back, Miss Minutes. Yay. And she's as crazy as she was when we left her last season. Although, nice touch in blending in to the 1800s by looking like an analog clock. <laughs> Although, you're still a talking clock. So, <laughs> again, but hey, nice touch. And we kind of learned that, you know, he who remains has some kind of plan post death if he ever died, which I guess he's told Miss Minutes of because she's immortal effectively as well as he is. So, she would know all about it. And I guess we'll see what happens after this episode because that's all we know right now. So, although it's, it's interesting that it all revolves around that TVA manual, which, from what we know, it was written by Obi. So, is that related somehow? Like, is Obi? I don't know. I want it's, it's, it's more to him than we see on the screen, or is it just because he hasn't been mind wiped for the last thousands of who knows how long many years? He knows all this stuff, or is there some other? angle that we don't know about that's one of the big questions i currently have right because you know so far he's been a very helpful hero character you know uh, you know I, I, I one of the good guys i guess is what i'm trying to say and it's like but the book that he wrote which you know probably innocently enough hopefully is like all over the place for kind of the catalyst for for getting kang's variants knowledge and stuff at least in this scenario so you know what else have they used it for that could be interesting you know it reminds me of guinness world book of world records from back to the future too right where one simple book causes a bunch of time travel shenanigans Mm -hmm. yeah because did he help build the things with kang or just because he's been around for the beginning he just knows how to fix everything so he wrote the book or yeah i I don't know i guess we'll find out or not seems like if he introduced him that's all he does is just know things because he's not been mind wiped and he fixes stuff that's one thing but i don't know in, in your tv economy of characters paranoia thing is there like a dark side to him i don't know that's or was he completely it seems too happy and nice to not just but be he like could a, have been you know, innocently taken advantage of by kang right when kang needed him to help set all this up so i don't know yeah yeah i mean is he there at the end of time just at the bottom of the bowels of the tva like kang's up at the top like i don't know they just forgot about him again <laughs> he's, he's still down there working <laughs> yeah waiting for uh, things to come down to repair. Yeah. And then we learn that uh, this version of He Who Remains doesn't like to share. Uh, anytime someone gets close to him, he kind of gets rid of them. You know, Rona's like, yeah, we can be partners. Uh, yeah, no, goodbye. 
dumpster and a rowboat sets her off down the uh, the lake. And then when Miss Minutes is like, oh, I love you, we can be together. He's like, nope, turn you off. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then, you know, we get the, they get sent to the Citadel at the end of time. And then we see that, you know, Miss Minutes has a secret about Ravona. Again, we don't know yet because that's where it left off. Again, from my time in Comic World, Kang's in love with Ravona, and you know she got killed in some attack or something, and he spends the rest of creation trying to like bring her back or something. So I don't know how that's going to play out in the second half of the season, but I guess we'll find out what her secret really is next time. Yeah, that's the romantic side of it was was the path I thought they were going to take us down uh, between the two of them until he dumped her in the rowboat. Right? Of course, there's already always more variants out there so maybe it'll work out with one of them when she finds the right king variant to hang out with maybe somebody who ruled egypt for example or something i don't know yeah because you know if you're in love again with one version of somebody then there's an infinite theory number of them out there so or is it you love the first one you saw not the not not the, not the copy or the variant i don't know we'll find out i'm sure because they wouldn't just drop that and then not talk about it next time right all right, so anything else you want to talk about or mention that we did not already cover in this first half? Nothing specific. I, I think I'll just reiterate how much I'm enjoying this show. Uh, it's you know unpredictable. It's great writing, great acting, and this is this is what I've missed in the Marvel shows. So it's it's great to have them kind of rolling on all cylinders so far. Yeah, because it, it, it's serious, but at the same time, not. Secret Invasion was probably too serious because it was like, you know, high stake political thriller intrigue, you know, who's who, you know, body snatcher kind of thing. This, yeah, I mean, it, it's obviously a much grander scale because you're dealing with the destruction of whole universes and timelines, but it's also abstract where you don't really, it's too much to think about in detail. So it's just because it's an abstract thing. So it's more human relations and, and comedy and little drama with, with you know, people's personal lives and that kind of stuff along with along with the drama of the whole thing but yeah again this has been one of the better series of marvel mcu tv shows that they've they've done last season and this season so far so I, yeah I, I can't wait to see where it, where it wraps up here in the last three episodes which i think they're not going to do a season three so i think that i know of so i think they're going to wrap this up permanently somehow in the next three episodes that's that's hard to believe but could be that's that's amazing if they pull it off yeah i mean you can keep going with it because obviously Loki left the Avengers movies to come here, and then when he goes back, finally, he's going to die, as we saw. Spoilers for the Avengers films if you haven't seen them already. <laughs> well, not not this variant. That's why he's a variant. So Yeah, well, at least well, there's Sylvie, and we still have, like the, the little kid with the, and the, the crocodile Loki, and we got all the other variants of Loki, too. So True, if but they I, wanted I mean, to, they could keep going with, with Loki with another Loki. But This guy's not going to go back, right? I think he's already broken that timeline by leaving, is my point. Well, he did go back, though in the movies so but which one i don't know we'll see what we'll see we'll see the way they go with it but yeah i think i think in the sacred timeline he did but i think in this timeline he didn't his timeline you know what i'm saying the one he they pulled him from anyway yeah I, we can tangent for that one for a bit <laughs> yeah i mean again anything's possible because it's yeah sci-fi I, and and time I, travel and the timey wimey stuff so you could you can do all kinds of stuff you can take the same version of loki that is identical except you know whatever you know so who knows yeah I think what we're saying is they have all the time in the world. Exactly right. All right. So next time, obviously, besides the Farscape show we talked about earlier, if you listen to that, we'll also cover the remaining three episodes of Loki season two. So that is your single or double homework for next time. And we'll see you then. Goodbye. And remember, be excellent to each other. <laughs> yeah. Pilot says that Moya will starbust. Oh my gosh. Sorry. To... <laughs> well, hey, I could have some fun. <laughs> I guess we're going to have a star voice. I don't know what that was. Is that when a starburst fails? You have a, a, star, a starbust? Is it... <laughs>